Good morning. Good morning, Wollaston Congregational Church. Anyone who might be joining us for this live video feed or perhaps replaying the video later in the day, I extend to you the warmest welcome to this time of worship. We're in somewhat of a different setting um, given the call to um, social isolation to prevent the spread of the uh, coronavirus pandemic um, or at least slow it down and give our health services a chance to keep up and so um, I encourage you to go along with this and um, I hope that this time of being together in worship and in prayer and um, a sense of uh, community and contact over the internet will help you um, in this time of isolating. And so we're going to come into our time of worship in the usual style. Um, the only thing is I haven't had time to do a lot of preparation for this. So this isn't like a nice smooth presentation. This is just me um, speaking to you. And so in terms of having music and um, artwork to reflect on, I have posted some links on the um, Wollaston Congregational Church Facebook page. And I suggest you just go ahead and scroll down to those links whenever you want to access them. Um, I won't stop for a hymn because there'd be a long pause, but if you would like to pause the video and listen to a hymn during this time, um, you're welcome to do that. And if you'd like to listen to it later, you can do the same. I began with the suggestion of listening to that beautiful song, Teach Me. And I've just been listening to it myself as a preparation for worship. And so I begin with a welcome and announcements, as I always do. Welcome to you. Um, I extend to you the wide open welcome of the United Church of Christ, saying whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome, even in this virtual space. Um, for our congregation, I want to express gratitude um, for those who worked really hard to prepare for the St. Patrick's Day dinner that would have happened yesterday, but we had to cancel. Um, and for all those who hope to come and have a time of fellowship and um, a good meal and um, good times together. I'm sorry we couldn't do that. I also extend my prayers and thanks to the people who helped to make today's service happen. Um, Marion, Alice, Rebecca, who would have all been, I know, ready to be at the church and um, sharing worship with you. And I'm sorry that that preparation um, time was lost. Um, but hopefully we'll be together in person in just two or three weeks. Let's see how this goes. And so um, I open with a verse from Psalm 46 to remind us all. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And so let's remember that we are coming together in this way, in this virtual way, so that the isolated may feel less alone, so that the stressed may find a time to pause, rest and draw breath, and so that the anxious may have an opportunity to give over their prayers to God. We are coming into the third Sunday in Lent, and we are continuing in our Lenten program of entering the passion of Jesus, even though we are doing it in this different way. We continue on our journey through Lent as we step inside the story of a teacher who turned the world upside down. And as with each week, we put ourselves in the picture of Holy Week so that we might take a closer look and let the ancient story open us to deeper conviction for the call to follow the teacher, Jesus. I invite you to enter, enter the story, enter the place you belong, not just looking on, for this is your story. Enter the story. Last week, Jesus in this last week, Jesus doesn't lay low. He puts himself out there, susceptible to those who want to trap him, to twist his words, to get to him, to say something damning. 
He cannot turn from his vocation. He is not only a master teacher, he is also a prophet and the voice of the divine. It is his ability to draw people to his teachings that pose a threat, a challenge to the authorities. And so we place ourselves in the crowd this week to be moved and motivated by Jesus for our lives, to get a faithful perspective. What would we have seen, heard and felt? And what do we do now? And so I invite you into our prayer of confession. May we pray together. We come here to encounter the teachings of Jesus. Many wanted to destroy him for these teachings. And sometimes we find that his words challenge us, calling us to more than we think we can be or do. Forgive us, O oh God. Let us be shaped into a new people, made in the mold of justice, not the stamp of Caesar's coin. You entered our story through Jesus. Now help us to enter fully into the story of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our first hymn would be, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. And if you would like to scroll down and play that now, you're welcome. Otherwise, I'm just going to read um, the second verse of that hymn. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things you do impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. And so, our assurance of pardon. Know this. There are people whose lives have been changed completely by this story of love and passion. Transformation is possible. You are forgiven and freed, encouraged and loved by a God who wants you to live fully. And so may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Now we come into our time of the gospel reading. We're going to have the first gospel reading. Um, it's from Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, the emperors. And then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. Now we come to our dwelling in the story part of the service and our dramatic readings. And so we have an introduction for a second gospel reading. Being tested was nothing new for Jesus. During his ministry, he was faced time and again with situations in which he was asked to defend his teachings against the way we've always done it. Indeed, his entire ministry was preceded by temptation. Just after John baptized him, he was led into the wilderness journey and was tempted to use his status as God's son, but ends not becoming of a humble servant. No wonder Jesus could recognize deceit in the Pharisees' spies and the Herodians' questions in Jerusalem that week. He had experienced it before in the form of evil incarnates. Then the spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. And the tempter came to him and said, 
Since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus replied, it's written. People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him to the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down. For it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take up their hands so that they won't hit your foot on a stone. And Jesus replied, again, it is written, don't test the Lord your God. And then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him and angels came and took care of him. And so now, if you are wanting to listen to some music during this sermon, um, I invite you to scroll down and listen again to the song, Teach Me. If you like, you could look at the artwork I've also posted, um, the picture of Jesus teaching in the temple and the zoom in on our one particular eyewitness. Jesus kept showing up at the temple that week, even after the skirmish in the temple market. You'd think he would back off, lay low, stay out of the way. His name was on the watch list for sure. He had been for some time. I hear that even when he was born, he was perceived as a threat. That's what I hear before my time here, though. My allegiance is to Herod, and I've been placed here to help oversee the Jews this week. This Passover party here in the city makes me nervous. The place is packed. We were instructed to see if we could get this Jesus to say something that would prove he means to harm the state. Then he will encourage people to disobey Roman laws, and that will he will create a rebellion, and that will get ugly. And so we were instructed to catch this guy saying something so we can charge him with it. They teamed us up with some Pharisees, Jewish priests, that oversee the rules for their own people. These particular priests are no more than spies, I would say. They want him to shut down as much as Herod does. But they lay it on thick, I tell you. Cozying up and telling him he's such an amazing teacher, I decided to stay out of the way. It actually makes my stomach turn, all this deceitful stuff. I'm sure this guy will go off the rails and end up in prison or worse. I just hope it's quick. What? What did he just say? Well, this is something. He's got the Pharisees reaching into their pocket to get out a denarii. Ah, well, I'll be. This guy is good. No, nothing wrong with that answer. They won't be able to get him today. Actually, I'd have to say I'm curious. There's something about him. I wouldn't mind hearing more. Perhaps I'll volunteer to keep an eye on him. Although what I really want is just to be around him and hear what else he has to say. There's, there's something about him. And so enter. Enter the passion. Enter the place where we belong. Not just looking on. Enter the story. Enter the passion. Enter his passion. And so we come into our time when we have our sermon. May we pray together. Holy God, open our eyes to what you would have us see. Open our ears to what you would have us hear and open our hearts to those whom you would have as love. Amen. I was once asked, albeit indirectly, are you comfortable with Jesus? Today, as we observe Jesus' teaching in the temple courts, I ask you this same question. Are you comfortable with Jesus? As a rabbi, Jesus' style of teaching includes addressing students' questions. 
We can imagine huddles of disciples around the various teachers in the temple courts. Their voices might be raised as they question and even argue, trying to get to the heart of an issue. The Pharisees send some of their disciples to question Jesus. They are seeking to test or trap him with a cunning question, and they are smart about it. They get together with the opposition, the supporters of Herod. The Pharisees want the people of Israel to remain faithful and loyal to God above everything else. They want to keep the temple pure and free from Roman interference and idolatry. The Herodians, on the other hand, are supporters of Herod. They are happy to collaborate with Rome. Perhaps they see that there is a financial benefit for those who cooperate with the empire. And they admire Herod for his ability to work both sides. He keeps the enormous temple open, including an ongoing construction project. And he maintains a position of power in Jerusalem, residing in his lavish powers. Our eyewitness for today, Marcus, is among the Herodians. He hangs at the back of the group, taking in what Jesus has to say. First of all, the two groups flatter Jesus for his sincerity and impartiality, and they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? This is an open-ended question. It demands a simple yes or no answer. They are referring to Jewish law, not the law of the empire. The empire's taxes are not popular with the Jewish people. The money the empire takes from the very poorest citizens goes straight back to Rome. They don't see the benefits. And we can be sure that the more wealthy collaborators have worked out some kind of a deal so they don't have to pay so much. The Herodians want to find out whether Jesus is encouraging the Jews to rebel against Rome. And he says that if he says it is unlawful for them to pay taxes to the emperor, they will have evidence that he is encouraging a rebellion. The Pharisees, on the other hand, are sticklers for the law of God. They are not happy about the Roman occupation in any way. They want the Jewish people to rule themselves as a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. The law dictates that not even, uh, they are not even to bring a Roman coinage into the temple because it shows the image of Caesar and declares a great blasphemy, that he is the son of the divine. Caesar Augustus. In reply to the tricky question, Jesus cuts through the noise. He chastises the two groups for being hypocrites and then asks them to show him a coin used for tax. They present him with a Roman denarius, complete with the Caesar's likeness and inscription. And so he asks, whose head is this and whose title? It is the emperor's head, of course. And so he says, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and the things to God that are God's. Jesus is an amazing teacher. Even his opponents admit that this is the case. He chastises, answers and challenges them. He's like a teacher of unruly students. They have disrupted the class to trip him up. But instead of shutting them down, he gives them something to think about. We often experience our best learning when we are challenged and given something to think about. Many teachers provide good information to their students. We all need to know the facts, but it's the challenges and the questions that make us think, and they move us on to a whole new level. One of my most respected teachers in seminary was the now retired UCC pastor and professor, Reverend Dr. Mary Lutey. Mary has a wonderfully warm personality. She forms strong bonds with her students, but she doesn't let them off lightly. She challenges them to grow as they study, to become better versions of themselves. One of the first classes I took with Mary was a preaching class. I expected good things, as Mary is an excellent preacher. I was surprised, though, when she provided the class with a list of books that addressed the Jewishness of Jesus. One of the books on the list was written by the author of our Lenten study book, Amy Jill Levine. 
Members of the class were required to write a paper on one of these books. The intent of this requirement was to make the future preachers in the class aware of the damage done to the Jewish community by so much Christian teaching and preaching. At first, my thought was, of course, I know that Jesus was Jewish, and of course, I would not want to perpetuate anti-Semitism in my preaching. I picked up a required book, Has God Only One Blessing, by Mary C. Boys, and I began my reading. In my reflection afterwards, I wrote that I began reading the book with this question in mind. How do I discover a theology that honors the Jewish faith and maintains Christ as God incarnate? Hmm. That is rather a convoluted question, which seems to anticipate a certain outcome. It is not an open-ended question at all. You might say it is a trick question. I had a lot to learn. Fortunately, my learning about Judaism and the damage done by Christian theologies did not end with this book review. A couple of years later, I was plunged into an atmosphere of Jewish learning when I took a program in a Jewish institution. The program was to function as a border crossing in my preparation for ministry. I was to spend a period of time studying with people from a different culture. In my case, this culture was Judaism. And so I began my studies with a group of ordained, experienced rabbis and another Christian minister. As a group, we received trainings and teaching from our supervisor and the resident rabbi of the facility. And also, each week, one of the students would present a teaching, only mood, for the other students. I discovered that Jewish students seem to enjoy learning much more than Christians. They are encouraged to question and push back at the teacher, just like those Pharisees and Herodians in the temple. Often they learn from one another by gathering in pairs to do a text study or have Luta learning. This can be quite a noisy process with a lot of arguments going on. During this time, I learned more about the appalling distortions of Jesus' teachings, which sowed the seeds for cruel events such as the Crusades and the Holocaust. And I learned that we can only interpret the gospel when we understand Jesus as fully Jewish. When we understand Jesus as challenging what was troubling about religious observance for him and his group, then we can begin to challenge what troubles us about our group. In other words, we may notice the log in our own Christian eye. I was sobered to realize that many Christians still hold a supersessionist theology. This is the theology that says Christianity replaces Judaism. It says that Jesus' teachings supersede the law, even though we are told in the gospel that it does not. It says that the New Testament supersedes the Old Testament. That's one reason why I now refer to the earlier testament as the Hebrew scriptures. Following my learning on the border crossing, I replaced my original convoluted question with two much simpler questions. The first was, why would I stay in a religion that allowed terrible things, such as pogroms and the Crusades and the Holocaust? Well, you could argue that all religions have allowed terrible things, but this is about noticing the log in our own Christian eye. The second question was even simpler and open-ended. Are you comfortable with Jesus? These questions were posed indirectly by my fellow students during the course of our time together. When I wrote my final paper, I provided the answers I had in mind at the time. I also said that these questions would sit with me some time to come, and indeed, they still sit with me now. But back to the temple courts and our eyewitness for today. It seems at first that Jesus gives a clear answer to the Herodians' question and the Pharisees' question. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. And yet they are still left with a question. What are the things of the emperor and what are the things of God? Psalm 24 must ring in the Pharisees' ears. 
The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For God has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. It all belongs to God, the earth and everything in it. It is all to be given to God. The Pharisees may have hoped that Jesus would settle the argument for them and say that it is unlawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And at the same time, he would incriminate himself. But instead, he presents them with a challenge. Do they truly live as though everything belongs to God? The Herodians may be a little slower to pick up on this idea. Our eyewitness, Marcus, ponders Jesus' response. Not all the Herodians are Jewish, and those who are value the practicality of allegiance to Rome over devout obedience to the God of Israel. Perhaps they assume that Jesus has just answered the question in their favor, that the people should give their denarii back to Caesar. And yet Jesus' answer hints at resistance of the empire. Give back those denarii to Caesar. The Jewish people's allegiance is to their God and only God. They will not carry the image of the emperor in their pouches. They will not tolerate the inscription, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine Augustus. And so today, we are left with the same question as Marcus. This teacher, this rabbi Jesus, who challenges and provokes with his teachings, are you comfortable with him? May all God's people say, Amen. Hmm, amen. So we come into our time of prayer now. Um, if we were together, we would sing together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the refrain. So here it is, just the words. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so may we come into our time of prayer. May we remember today the teachings of Jesus and give thanks to God for the power of his words and actions that have transformed so many lives. We remember to Day, those who teach and preach in the pursuit of right living and right relationship. And we especially remember teachers at this time as they hustle to put online lessons together, as they must worry about their students, how they will learn, how they will socialize, whether they will be cared for, whether they will eat until school opens again. We ask that you comfort all those who worry, to give rest and strength and health to all those who work to care for our well-being and to protect us. We ask that you will give wisdom, humility, courage, and a clear mind to all those in positions of leadership, that you would bring peoples of this world together in a spirit of compassion and mercy. And now, let us call to our mind's eye perhaps with our eyes closed, those people in our lives that need our advocacy, presence, and prayers. And so among the people we remember today, I think of Tennessee following devastating tornadoes, people of Syria in that war-torn place, people of Spain and Italy, the poor of the world who struggle daily, who don't even, many of them know, there is this virus going around. And I invite you in the silence or in the comments section just to add um, the names and comments of people and places who are on your heart this morning. If you use the comment field, please just give an initial or a first name. And so let us lift our silent prayers to God. And so I invite you, as I usually do, um, to join with Christians throughout the ages and Christians around the world to pray the prayer Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if we were together today, we would come to our time of giving and receiving of offering. And I would say our offering is about to be given and received for the work of this church, in this community, and in the world beyond. And so the fact remains we still do need pledges and offerings, especially because many of our building users have had to cancel. Um, if you were in the habit of giving that um, pledge or offering on a weekly basis, I would ask that you could send it, mail it to the church. And also at this time, let's remember organizations who are being stretched thin. I've had word from both Interfaith Social Services and Father Bills. Um, ISS is in need of extra food because people are coming to them and they are going to be open just like any other grocery store. So if you're getting stir crazy and you'd like to run an errand, they could use kid snacks, they could use protein and produce cooking oil, um, the ever evasive um, toilet paper, um, people are on the lookout for that. So anything that you um, feel moved to do, um, I invite you to do it. Our closing hymn would be, Are You Able? Um, and so I'll read a few words from that. And you can, um, when we're done, you can scroll down and play that um, song as well. Are you able, said the master, to be crucified with me? Yea, the sturdy dream is answered to the death. We follow thee. And the refrain goes, Lord, we are able. Our spirits are thine. Remold them, make us like thee divine. Thy guiding radiance above us shall be a beacon to God, to love and loyalty. And so our benediction today is um, going to be a prayer. Um, the name of the prayer is Pandemic. It's by Reverend Lynn Ongar, a prayer and a poem. What if you thought of it as the Jews considered the Sabbath, the most sacred of times? Cease from traveling, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your hearts. Reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly when we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. Amen. And so may you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>